I'm just setting up the YouTube mm -hmm. live streaming. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third um, in our Foltishar learning series. I'm absolutely delighted today to have Paolo Boncho discussing fault displacement hazard, a geological perspective. Um, I'm sure most of you know Paolo, if not all of you know Paolo, for all his work um, on this topic and all his work in structural geology as a field geologist and, and an expert on Italian geology in particular. Um, I just think it's always worth pointing out just how influential his work is. Um, he has over 2,600 citations from his peer-reviewed work, um, including an H-index of 27. So a huge number of papers and a huge influence on the field. So as always, we're very grateful for the people who are sharing their knowledge and helping to teach us all about subjects so that we can all understand and promote us working together. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Paolo and uh, thank you very much in advance for your talk, Paolo. Okay, uh, thank you, Joanna, for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and thank you to everyone to be to be here. And good afternoon. So the the topic of my talk is fault displacement uh, hazard, a geological perspective. Uh, the talk is organized in uh, three parts. Uh, first, the physical phenomenon, then uh, mitigation strategies. Uh, mitigate means uh, any action aimed at reducing the risk from a geological perspective in my, in my talk. And then the importance of, of a database uh, and an application. So please stop me anytime if I'm not clear, if you have any question. So fault displacement hazard is a very localized hazard due to rupture of the ground surface from slip along an earthquake fault or uh, from a fault creep. But in my presentation, I will talk only of uh, co-seismic faulting, not creep. And this may damage buildings and facilities sited on or in the vicinity of, of the fault trace. Uh, fault displacement hazard is particularly relevant for critical facilities, for example, nuclear facilities or dams. This is the Shikang Dam uh, displaced uh, vertically about nine meters by the Chelumpu Trust during the 1999 Chichi earthquake. And it's also relevant for long infrastructures. Uh, also because uh, often long infrastructures cannot avoid uh, fault displacement uh, hazard. Uh, this is, for example, a, a water pipe which was broken in four parts uh, during the recent uh, magnitude 6.4 Petrinia earthquake in Croatia uh, by right lateral strikes leap of about 10, 10 centimeters. But uh, the successful performance of the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline after the magnitude 7.9 Denali earthquake, uh, in the left we have the, the pipeline before the earthquake and to the right, the, the pipeline after the earthquake. After the earthquake, the, the pipe slid on the sliders uh, was distorted, but did not fail. 
So the successful performance of the oil pipeline indicates that uh, fault displacement hazard can be mitigated if fault is identified and characterized by intensive geologic investigations and uh, engineered uh, design, of course. Uh, how can we prevent the risk from fault displacement hazard? Uh, the classical approach is avoidance, built away from the fault, which uh, relies on a basically on a deterministic approach. But uh, if the fault cannot be avoided, or if the fault uh, is discovered after uh, structure con construction. In this case, both the deterministic and the probabilistic analysis can be used in, in, in the analysis. Uh, very important. Uh, it, I will talk of fault displacement hazard analysis for defining zones or probabilities of surface rupture in areas around active faults. But the conclusive assessment can be established only by detailed geologic investigation and paleoseismology of the site. I will not talk of this. This was the topic of the last talk by Francesca Cinti. So who missed the talk can watch again in, a, in YouTube. OK, uh, we are talking of co-seismic primary effects, uh, a fault with potential for displacing the ground surface um, during an earthquake is also called a capable fault. And there are several controlling factors uh, uh, of the phenomenon. First, uh, the size of the earthquake. In general, surface faulting occurs uh, above magnitude 5, 5.5, but there are uh, exceptions. Uh, for example, the depth of the source. This is the magnitude 4.9 uh, Lete earthquake in France, which produced uh, surface faulting of several centimeters, and the nucleation uh, was very shallow, about one kilometer uh, deep. Uh, another exception is for volcano tectonic environments. This is from uh, uh, Azzaro, 2004, for Eastern Sicily, east of the Etna volcano. Surface faulting uh, occurred for magnitudes as low as 3.5, with quite large displacement, uh, for example, about 30 centimeters uh, in this case. Not all the active faults are capable, even if the, the magnitude is sufficiently large and the depth is uh, relatively shallow. This is the case uh, of the 2012 Trust earthquake in Emilia, Italy. Magnitude 6.1, depth less than 10 kilometers, but only uplift and, and folding. This is another interesting case, San Fernando, 1971, and the Northridge, 1994. Uh, same focal depths, same kinematics, trust, but San Fernando produced uh, surface faulting and Northridge, no. Uh, this is due uh, to the structural relations between the two trusts, because the, the, the Northridge trust uh, abuts, stops upwards on the San Fernando trust plane. But in general, thrust faults are less likely to produce surface faulting compared to other uh, kinematics. This is rather obvious because of the shallow dip uh, of the fault and, because, and 
because of the large component of the information accommodated by ductile uh, folding. Uh, this is a diagram from Moss and Ross 2011 showing the probability of surface folding for reverse uh, normal and uh, uh, all slip types. The probability for, for reverse folds uh, is significantly lower than that for normal and all slip types. For, for example, if we have a magnitude 6.5, the probability is about 35% for reverse. It is 80% for normal and about 70% if we consider all the kinematics uh, together. Okay, the, the surface rupture can occur along a narrow principal fold trace or can be distributed in a wider zone. This uh, uh, affects, sorry. There is a delay in the presentation. Okay. Okay. This affects the, the, the width of the rupture of the rupture zone. Okay, in general, uh, in full displacement hazard, uh, distributed rupture is a general term indicating secondary ruptures around and away from the principal or primary folds. And can be distant from the principal fold. So we have principal and distributed uh, ruptures. Distributed rupture can occur kilometers away from the principal fold. Uh, as uh, a, a for the 2016 magnitude 6.5 Central Italy normal faulting earthquake. Uh, sometimes it is difficult to, to identify a single principal fault trace because the main slip is partitioned more or less equally among uh, parallel or branching strands of the principal fault uh, particularly for strike slip ruptures. So in these cases, uh, we can define a principal uh, fold zone. Uh, uh, in this diagram, uh, which is inspired by normal folding earthquakes, I try to uh, define and classify the different typologies of ruptures. So we have the principal fold, which is the breaching of the ground surface along the trace of the main fault uh, responsible for the release of, of seismic energy. In, in general, it is a narrow rupture zone. Uh, it is characterized by larger displacement compared to distributed ruptures, longer continuity, uh, and in general, long-term geologic evidence. Uh, this can be mapped before the earthquake. This is important. For, for the hazard. And distributed ruptures are secondary displacement on faults in the vicinity of the principal fault, tens of meters to kilometers away from the principal fault, connected or non-connected to the principal fault, and can be secondary discontinuous short with small displacement with no geologic evidence before the earthquake, something uh, unexpected, poorly predictable. Uh, and uh, we call this kind of rupture uh, simple, this good ruptures. And uh, often we have a larger uh, concentration in, in uh, structural complexities such as um, a step over. And then we can have a, a distributed rupture on major secondary synthetic or antithetic splays with long continuity, large displacement, 
Long-term geologic evidence can be mapped before the earthquake. So something similar to the principal fault, but secondary. There's leap when the principal fault does and can have their uh, <laughs> simple distributed ruptures. And then we can have discontinuous, short, small displacement on pre-existing faults uh, not connected to, to the seismogenic source and also very far, can be very far from, or, from the principal fault. We call this trigger or sympathetic distributed ruptures. Uh, for dipping faults, these data are from normal faults. Uh, there is an asymmetric distribution. Most of, of the ruptures are in the ending world. Later, we will see uh, a similar distribution for reverse earthquakes. Uh, for strike slip events, the distribution is, is uh, more symmetric. Uh, distributed uh, rupture uh, can occur away from the principal fault, also several kilometers, but most of them concentrate near the principal fault, meters, 200 of meters from the principal fault. So we can define, define a, a far field and a near field. In the near field, the, the hazard from distributed faulting is, faulting is higher. Okay, near surface geology can be very important in controlling the characteristics and width of the rupture zone. This is a table uh, simplified from a paper by Terran et al, 2015. Uh, main controlling factors are lithology and thickness of the surface material. The rupture zone is localized in bedrock and wide in unconsolidated sediments. And the width increases uh, with the, with thickness of, of soft material. Uh, the magnitude of the displacement matters. Uh, there are two competing uh, scale-dependent factors. Uh, at a local scale, high slip fa favors uh, localized scar. Low slip favors uh, distribution in small fractures. Uh, at wider scale, Large slip means large deforming volumes with the wide distributed rupture zone, uh, for example, activation of several splays. And also the geometry and kinematics are important. The rupture zone width uh, decreases as fall deep increases, is controlled by complexity, for example, step overs, and increases for oblique slip due to partitioning. So uh, a brief summary of part one, uh, the source of the hazard is uh, earthquake surface faulting. Uh, in general for earthquake, earthquakes with magnitude larger than five, but with exceptions. Faulting style matters because higher probability for normal, normal and strike slip faults compared to reverse faults. We have principal on fault and distributed of fault rupturing. Distributed rupturing depends on distance from principal fault. Uh, near surface geology matters lithology and thickness of soft sediment for complexity, geometry and kinematics, amount of slip. And key parameters are location and characterization of, of the principal fault and complexities, displacement, distance from the principal fault. So let's move to uh, mitigating uh, strategies, starting with uh, zoning and avoidance. Uh, a classical approach to uh, fault displacement hazard is uh, uh, zoning. Uh, in practice, uh, uh, the, the mitigation by zoning uh, implies uh, 
um, determine if a quaternary fault exists at the site of interest and classify according to the, to the activity, H. Determine accuracy of fault location. Define fault hazard zones. In general, restrictions and recommendations apply within the zones. And then site-specific geologic investigation are needed to quantify the hazard before building construction. In order to be efficient, uh, zoning actions must be regulated by laws or guidelines. Uh, these are examples, uh, three examples. The California Alquis Priolo Fault Zoning Act is a law, the Japanese law, and the New Zealand, New Zealand guidelines. Uh, it is worth having a look at the Alquis Priolo Earthquake Fault Zoning Act adopted by the state of California since 1972. The Alquis Priolo defines regular, uh, regulatory uh, earthquake fault zones around the trace of active faults. The earthquake fault zones are typically 300 to 400 meters wide with variations. And within the zones, local agencies must require a geologic investigation to demonstrate that the building will not be on a, an active fault. If the healthy active fault is found, the building must be set back uh, from the fault, generally uh, 15 meters. So we have an earthquake fault zone and a setback. Uh, an active fault regulated under the Al Alquist Priolo Act is a fault with the Holocene activity. What about Europe? Uh, we have the Eurocode 8. The Eurocode Euro code 8 states that uh, buildings mm, uh, destined to human occupancy should not be erected in the immediate vicinity of active faults. An active fault is considered a fault with evidence of late quaternary activity. But it is not specified what immediate vicinity means. Moreover, single uh, European states should apply this uh, recommendation by specific regulation. To my knowledge, regulations against full displacement hazard are quite rare. Uh, in, in Italy, since 2015, we have guidelines. The purpose of the guidelines is to uh, guide uh, geoscience uh, practitioners and planners in uh, identify, active, identify active and capable pools by definitions, shape and size hazard zones, perform uh, fault investigations, and provide uh, recommendations for uh, for planning. Uh, a capable fault is defined as a fault with evidence of activity in the last 40 uh, kilo years. So uh, late Pleistocene Holocene. Latest Pleistocene Holocene. Uh, we started writing the guidelines after the 2009 Laguila earthquake, magnitude 6.3. The surface faulting was small, with the maximum vertical displacement of nearly 15 centimeters. But, but this created several problems in the municipality of the L'Aquila town. For example, uh, here, uh, the surface faulting produced a, a, a tilting of a few degrees or, and internal fracturing of this building. So the final result after the engineering check was demolition and reconstruction. Okay, but the reconstruction where? Uh, in the same place, uh, this makes no sense. Uh, 
from a geologic point of view. Uh, so uh, where? How far from the original position? How far from the pole? Similar cases blocked uh, several reconstructions because at the time of the earthquake, there were no regulation, there were no uh, guidelines against full displacement hazard. Uh, we decided to use data from the L'Aguila surface faulting to write the guidelines. Here, uh, I summarized in this uh, schematic uh, section, uh, the, the surface faulting during the L'Aguila earthquake. We had co-seismic faulting um, along the main fault, uh, along splays of the main fault located 30 to 35 meters away from the principal fault, and also splay located 100 to 140 meters away from the principal fault. In writing the guidelines, we decided to take into account those numbers. And we used also the results of a, a study aimed at a me measuring the width of the rupture zone for uh, several normal faulting earthquakes worldwide uh, in order to uh, propose a methodology for, uh, for zoning uh, the fault displacement uh, as a uh, in the guidelines, the fault zoning is uh, done during uh, seismic microzonation studies. It is a two-step process. Uh, in seismic microzonation studies, uh, we have different levels of seismic um, microzonation. During the, the first level, which is the, uh, the level with the lowest detail, uh, we define uh, warning zones uh, around an active uh, fault. Uh, it is a zone conceptually equivalent to the earthquake fault zone of the Alquis Priolo Fault Zoning Act. Uh, and it should include all the reasonable inferred fault displacement hazards from the principal fault and most of the distributed faulting in the near field, and also uncertainties in locating the, the principal fault uh, trace. Uh, within the, the warning zone, which is usually 400 meters wide, uh, level three, the highest level of detail, is mandatory uh, before new edification. In general, this step is done by professional geologists uh, who, in general, are not experts in active tectonics. So they use uh, published data for identifying active faults, capable faults. In the third level of seismic microzonation, the highest detail, uh, uh, after detailed geologic investigation, there are several detailed geologic investigation in order to define uh, narrow fault avoidance zones uh, uh, around well-defined uh, map uh, fault traces. In general, they are 30 meters wide uh, in order to include the most likely old rupture hazard. If there are, uh, if some uncertainties persist, for example, in the location of the fault, because we can have some secondary faults because of the powers, for example, complexities, um, there are a, a susceptible zone. The width is variable depend, depending on the uncertainty. And in, in those areas, only design-oriented, site-specific investigation can solve the problem of the hazard. Uh, uh, okay, the zones are suggested to be asymmetric for deep 
slipping folds and uh, uh, symmetric for uh, strike slip folds. So again, a, a short summary from this part. So zoning is an efficient mitigation strategy based on a deterministic approach, uh, defines regulatory zones. In order to be effective, uh, the, the zoning strategy needs official regulation, official guidelines to define the hazard, to guide fault investigations and, and for recommendations and restrictions uh, within the zones. Uh, okay, I didn't talk about that, but the, the official catalogs of active faults are very important for uh, practitioners because often practitioners don't know what is an active fault, uh, what is not uh, an active fault. And in general, zones do not account for near surface geology. So this, this problem can be solved only by site-specific investigation and modeling. Uh, in any case, detailed, detailed geologic investigations are required before construction to define all the parameters relevant, the precise location of the fault, uh, the fault characterization, the width of the fault zone, uh, displacement per band, etc. So now I move to the probabilistic approach. Uh, probabilistic fault displacement hazard analysis is an extension of the classical uh, ground shaking probabilistic seismic hazard analysis to fault displacement. It was first developed uh, for the nuclear waste repository at the uh, Yucca Mountain, Nevada, and was published by Yang et al. in uh, 2003. There are two approaches, earthquake, two approaches proposed, uh, earthquake approach and displacement approach. Uh, probabilistic fault displacement other analysis can help estimating the likelihood of occurrence of displacement uh, when, uh, when, for example, fault cannot be avoided, uh, uh, when an active fault is discovered after building the construction or because new stricter regulations require fault displacement other studies. Uh, is an approach which, which can account for principal and distributed rupturing. And it's an approach uh, which can help uh, risk-based reasoning, risk-based approaches. For example, in defining priorities of mediation. This is an example of, of uh, displacement hazard map by Peterson et al, 2011. This is the 10% probability of exceedance in 50 years for surface displacement in centimeters. And this kind of map uh, may help planners and the city officials in identifying priority of actions, priority of mediation. So it's an interesting approach uh, in practice. Uh, let's suppose we have a, a cable fault. First, you have to define the earthquake rates on the, on the principal fault. You need the data in black, uh, fault geometry, uh, the size of the expected earthquake slip rate, etc. So you need in any case a detailed invest investigation. So there is a component of the deterministic analysis inside. But okay, first you define the, the uh, earthquake rates on the fault, and then you define the probability of having the surface rupture, which is different depending on the style of faulting. Then you uh, define the probability of displacement along strike 
the principal fault using uh, models of displacement distribution along strike the principal fault. Then for sites located away from the principal fault, you can have distributed faulting. So you calculate the probability of distributed rupturing away uh, from the principal fault. A basic assumption of the method is that uh, displacement, uh, one can define displacement attenuation relationships uh, similar to ground motion prediction equation, equations. Uh, then you, you define the probability of having a displacement on distributed faulting uh, with distance from the principal fault R and we, depending also on the displacement D on the principal fault. And at the end, the final results in general are, are hazard curves of, uh, for example, annual rate of accidents of a, a certain value of, of displacement at the site. Okay, this is an example of application of this method to a, a normal fault in the, in the Northern Apennine. This is work by Alessio Testa and Alessandro Valentini. Alessio is doing his, his PhD in um, in this area, Alessandro is the modeler, and they calculated the uh, probability of displacement, different probabilities of, of displacement. Uh, for example, okay, I don't know if you can see my... Okay different uh, uh, probabilities of displacement. I will show you a, a, a zoom of this area. Okay, this is the 1% probability of accidents in 50 years of displacement. That means a return period of about 5,000 years. This is the, okay, this is the full trace, the principal full trace. This is the, the warning zone according to the Italian guidelines, 400 meters uh, wide. These are, for example, the displacement expected 1% in 50 years along the principal fault. Here we have 45, 50 centimeters. We have a, a 11 kilometers long fault magnitude 6.1 in this scenario, they use the 1.6, the maximum slip rate possible. And, and the maximum displacement along the fault is decreasing along strides toward the tips because of the used model of displacement distribution along the fault. And, and these are the expected displacement due to distributed faulting uh, within the zone. So we, we can draw some conclusion for, conclusions, for example. Uh, precise location of principal fault is very important. Uh, the hazard from this to do the rupture is, is very low. This is 1% in uh, 50 years. And the hazard uh, can be in urban areas, can be combined combined with the building importance categories to identify priorities of actions, for example. Uh, there are some open questions. For example, is the middle of the Bayang Setal appropriate for uh, estimating the, pro the distributed rupture, the other for distributed ruptures in the near field? Uh, well, uh, we are trying to answer uh, this question because, uh, in fact, the application of uh, probabilistic fault displacement hazard have highlighted uh, several knowledge gaps. Uh, these are sentences by McAlpin, uh, particularly concerning the, the distributed uh, faulting which in the original method was constrained by, by the only a few data points. 
So clearly more and better data uh, are needed. And this is the reason because I go towards the, yeah, the end of, of the presentation talking about the importance of, of a database, a database of, of surface uh, ruptures. Uh, um, uh, recently, uh, a database of surface ruptures for full displacement hazard has been published. Uh, the name of the database is, is SURE. It is the, the, the first result of a project led by Stefan Bess, IRSN Brands. Uh, uh, within the, base, uh, the database, there are uh, surface ruptures from 45 earthquakes with magnitude ranging from 5 to 7.9. All the kinematics inside represented. It is a compilation of well-studied historical earthquake surface ruptures. There are inside several co-seismic observations and the rupture segments in tables with the numerical data and, and the shape files. Uh, there is work in progress for, uh, for a new release of the database, the version 2.0. The aim is to include more events in the database and to and we are doing a work that we name ranking the ruptures. Uh, this work is, uh, is done by a team. Uh, there is uh, IRSN, of course, uh, and also uh, people from uh, ISPRA, Italy, and uh, INGP, Italy. Uh, and, uh, there will be a presentation on the uh, forthcoming virtual EGU on this new release. Uh, uh, to explain what ranking the ruptures means and the possible application to fall displacement hazard, I will show you the results of a work we have recently published we analyzed uh, the distributed ruptures of uh, 15 crustal reverse earthquakes, uh, ranging in magnitude from uh, 4.9 to 7.9 from different uh, tectonic settings. This is an example map. Uh, of the surface rupture for the Chi Chi earthquake in 1999. Uh, in red, we have the principal fault rupture. Uh, uh, this is rank one. Dots are proportional to vertical fault displacement. In blue, we have the uh, distributed rupture that we call a simple, simple uh, that are the unexpected ruptures. Uh, these are rank two. Uh, in orange, we have uh, primary distributed ruptures that are the reactivation of pre-existing synthetic or uh, antithetic splays, uh, the reactivation of uh, pre-existing scar, so something that can be mapped uh, before the earthquake. We rank this 1.5 because they are in between the principal and, and the simple distributed, one point. This is another nice example from Elasdam, 1980, magnitude seven, Point one, uh, with the other typologies of distributed rupture due to folding. We have bending moment uh, ruptures that we rank to one. We have flexural slip ruptures that we rank to two. And we have also uh, triggered slip on pre-existing folds not connected to the principal focus. 
that, that we rank three. This is what we mean for ranking the ruptures. Then we classified all the ruptures following this uh, ranking scheme represented, uh, summarized in this block diagram. Then we measure the systematically the distances between the principal and distributed ruptures. We use the uh, matrix that is different from that proposed by Yang et al. Yang et al used uh, a method called reading, uh, which assumes that the database of surface ruptures is complete for distributed ruptures. We use an approach that we call slicing. Uh, uh, there is no assumption of, completely, of completeness in our approach. So then we calculated the, the probability of occurrence depending on, on the distance from the principal fault. Uh, the histogram below show the distribution of the data. Most of the data are in the, in the hanging wall. Most of the data are the blue one, the simple distributed eruption. Then we have in pink the bending moment, in purple the plexus slip, orange the, the synthetic or anti display, and in green the triggers. Okay, and this is uh, an example of the statistical analysis for occurrence of distributed ruptures versus distance from, from the principal fault. Here we have the principal fault at zero. At the top, we have all typologies of distributed rush. In the X axis, we have the distance from the principal fault. Uh, hanging wall on the right, foot wall on the left. Uh, in the middle, we have the simple distributed ruptures. And the bottom, we have the primary distributed ruption, the measures place. Overall, uh, we can see uh, an attenuation with distance, but that the attenuation is mostly driven by, by simple distributed ruptures. Uh, so uh, for simple distributed rupture, we can define predictive equations, we, we, we think. So do you remember uh, one basic assumption of the probabilistic method is that you can define attenuation relationships uh, uh, with distance. So can the distributed ratio be predicted by attenuation relations? Uh, well, for simple, the answer is yes. And we can see also uh, a stronger attenuation in the football. Okay, different colors means different magnitude classes. Blue is seven and uh, above, green is from six to seven, red is from five uh, to six. Okay, but the attenuation is not so obvious for, uh, for the uh, primary distributed rupture because you, you can have a, the rupture or not, it depends if, if there is the measures play or not. It depends if there is the, a, a fold with the bending moment or, or not. So this is probably because the attenuation is, is not so, so obvious. Then we analyzed also the, the displacement. I don't have time to, to go into the details, but just to say that we, we found the relations uh, for the vertical displacement on distributed ruptures away from the principal fault, which depends on the distance from the principal fault, on the displacement on the principal fault, and uh, depends on the magnitude of the earthquake. In this uh, figure, we have the probability of distributed rupture for different magnitude classes, blue, green, and red, in the hanging wall and in the foot wall. Uh, for example, uh, if we, uh, for a magnitude seven, 
if we are at 500 meters away from the principal fault, we have a 45% probability of having distributed ruptures in the hanging wall. If you are in the footwall, the probabilities at, at, at 500 meter distance is 15%, so much lower. By combining this with the relation of displacement, we obtain, obtain this curve, which is the probability of accidents of a displacement bed. For example, if we are at 500 meters from the principal fault, if we have a magnitude seven earthquake, at 500 meters we have in the hanging wall, 77% probability of having 50 centimeters of displacement or higher. If we are in the foot wall, we have 15% probability. Of course, this of course, this is the maximum value possible because it is a generalized probability. The probability decreases because you have to take into account the size of the site of interest and the chance of having at least one rupture with, within, uh, within the site. So the, uh, uh, for a site-specific study, the probability is much uh, lower than that. There are, uh, okay, several uh, still open questions. For example, how can we account for complex distributed ruptures in the probabilistic world? Bending moment, the plexus slip, the, the measures place. There is some work in progress by Fia Nurminen. She is doing the, P, the PhD on this topic. Uh, for example, an idea we are working on is that uh, uh, simple the distributed rupture can be used to uh, define the probability, define regression for the near field, the hazard due to distributed faulting in the near field, and um, regression from complex distributed rupture, the other typology can be used, uh, for example, for assessing the hazard extent, the, the extent of the potential for displacement area uh, hazard in, in poorly known areas, or for selection, the, the area of investigation during the siting of, of critical facilities. Facilities. It is a work in progress. If you are interested in, in, in this, there is a, a presentation to the forthcoming virtual EGU by Fian Urmina. So I, I'm going to the conclusion with a short summary of part uh, of the last part. Probabilistic for displacement other analysis is a poorly known mitigating strategy of great potential, in my opinion. It can be used for faults that cannot be avoided, for faults discovered after construction, can account for principal distributed rupturing, helps risk-based approaches, uh, helps uh, identifying priority uh, for actions. Uh, in any case, needs detailed geological investigation. There is a deterministic component in any case inside. Uh, does not account for near surface geology, but specific regression for this for different types of near surface mythology may be developed. There is an attempt by Moss et al. 2018 based on uh, uh, shear wave velocities, ES30, and additional data mining and research is, is needed in this field to populate the database with uh, detailed surface rupture data to improve models for principal displacement, for, for displacement on the, on the principal fold and for displacement on distributed ruptures. So I finished and I'd like to thank you for your uh, attention. Some special, some special thanks to the working group guideline for active and capable folds. Uh, some people from the Department of Civil Protection. Uh, particular thanks to the Foltusha group, because inside Foltusha, a team we call, uh, was born. Now I call this team the European team for displacement hazard 
analysis. Uh, and the European team contributes now uh, to an international uh, project, the Fault Displacement Hazard Initiative, which is led by University of California, Los Angeles. Okay, thank you again. Thank you so much, Paolo. Um, very much appreciated. Um, I think we have time for a, just a couple of quick questions or, or one difficult question if, if Paolo wants it. Um, so if every, anyone does have a question, please uh, speak aloud or if you're unable to speak aloud, uh, do put it in the chat and we can read it out for Paolo. Hi there. Uh, if possible, I would have two very short questions. Yes. I was really impressed by your presentation. I liked it very much. It was a very good summary and very interesting for us. Uh, my questions uh, would, <clears throat> uh, would be on the capability of a fault. Uh, do you consider a fault capable if it um, causes displacement or also if it only causes fracturing and no, disp I mean, no vertical displacement? No, any kind of displacement to the ground surface or very close to the ground surface, any kind, horizontal, vertical opening. But to be honest, in analyzing the displacement for probabilistic analysis, uh, uh, often we are, uh, or we use net slip, or we use uh, okay, vertical, because the database are mostly populated by this kind of information. But any kind of displacement, horizontal, stack, slip, vertical. Okay, so including, for example, just extensional cracks. Uh, yes, in general, uh, extensional cracks are uh, considered for uh, mostly for uh, the probability of occurrence rather than for, uh, for example, analyzing the displacement distribution. We go open, yeah, mostly for, yeah, probability of occurrence. Okay, thank you. And my mother, uh, my, my other question relates to the 2012 Emily earthquake. Uh, yeah. You said that uh, that hap happened uh, above an uncapable fall, uh, but not long ago, I have just seen a paper um, on an atlas on the co-seismic effects of that earthquake. And it showed also displacements of, of a few decimeters. Uplift, I mean, probably. Um, yeah, vertical displacement, small, small uh, steps on the surface. Steps, uh, uh, well, I, uh, I know that there were uh, several fissures. Mm -hmm mostly associated to the to liquefaction. Mm -hmm. So they were not considered as primary effect sensu stricto, mostly related to liquefaction. So not, not primary okay. effects mm -hmm. in our uh, yeah, analysis. And, and the uplift, uh, is not considered in this kind of analysis because there is no a, 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 fault, a brittle faulting of the, of the surface. The simple uplift due to, for example, folding is not in, considered in this kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. So it means that if, uh, if in a setting like in Emilia, where you have quite thick soft sediment uh, mm -hmm. and you the area is prone to liquefaction, it is in fact not possible to uh, assess the surface rupture hazard. Yeah, in, because you, you need a, a mappable fault, you know? You, you, you can, you could yeah, draw a zone around a fault trace. Mm -hmm. In the Emilia, the faults are mostly bar barred mm -hmm. by thick, Pile, I pick pile of, of sediments. So, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. th thank you for your questions and for your comments. 
Thank you very much. Ali, you have a question. Joanna, sorry, I, I cannot. I, I lost the, <laughs> the main page of the Zoom. Uh, OK, but uh, ah, OK, the chat. I now see the chat. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting talk about uh, displacement hazard. Thank you. analysis and uh, app, your approach, it was for me very interesting. But as you know, in this method and in this field, very important parameters is uh, slip rate parameters for its faults or its segments of fault. I'm from Iran, Paulo. Yeah. Uh, 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 as you know, in very various kind of faults or in various segments of faults, we have no enough data about slip rates. We have some uh, GPS data usually, but uh, dating uh, data about slip rate, uh, I think we don't have enough data about this. What your suggestions and approach for solving these uh, uh, problems, this uncertainty, and it's very important we uh, have good data about sleep rate. But in uh, practical, we have you no know, some good, uh, well-defined data. In Italy, uh, your approach, I, I'm very interesting to know your approach. And my second uh, question is about similarity for evaluating of fault displacement in two kinds of faults, normal fight faults and reverse faults. Have we used the same uh, methods to evaluate of displacement of these two various kinds of faults? Thank you very much, Pablo. Yeah, th thank you for your question. Okay, the first one is slip rate. Uh, slip, you need a slip rate uh, if you are using probabilistic approaches for defining the rate of uh, uh, the earthquake rates on the, on the principal fault, and then derive the probabilities of surface ruptures, etc. Uh, if you don't, uh, for zoning, you don't need uh, the, the slip rate. You must classify, identify and classify the faults and define, and define zones. Uh, if you would like to apply a probabilistic approach, yes, uh, and, and you have to consider the time, uh, you need data on slip rates, of course, and paleoseismic data, possibly, no? Uh, so you should... Uh, to any, any possible uh, study to, to get this or uh, work with ranges of plausible uh, slip rates. We, we, for example, in the, in the exercise I have shown in the Northern Apennines, we explore uh, slip rates varying from 0.3 to 1.6. Uh, we explore the, the differences. For example, mm -hmm. so a possibility can be this one to explore uh, different slip rates uh, uh, that are consistent with the geodetic uh, strain rates. For example, concerning the say, I'm not sure to have understood the second question. If uh, was the question, did you apply to faults different than uh, normal and reverse? So to sex slip was that one the question? No, yes, I'm not. Uh, I mean. I mean uh, about uh, displacement, uh, amount of displacement in hanging wall and football of reverse fault and normal fault. It is uh, very different from together or uh, we can uh, use same procedures as okay. uh, you know, Moss and Ross uh, defined uh, some uh, methods or uh, uh, young. Uh, also uh, for normal parts, but uh, I calculate these two methods. I 
uh, that no high difference between two results. I am interested to know your uh, idea about these two types of bugs. Moser Ross uh, did the model for only for the principal form, not for distributed. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are working mostly on distributed faulting now. We have results for the reverse, but we are working on normal. So, sorry, eh? uh, uh, it is a work in progress, but I, I hope to ask where, uh, soon your question. There is uh, Fian Ulmin in doing a, her PhD on that. We are quite confident that we will have an answer uh, soon on that. Sorry. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, we have a question from Jan. Um, I think that might have to be the final question, but uh, you can just squeeze in there. Hi, Jan. Ciao, Paolo. Oh. Thanks for the talk. Uh, it looks like you, you have shown in your talk uh, inverse correlation between the size of the magnitude of the earthquake and the amount of the di distributed deformation, saying uh, the smaller the magnitude, the more distributed you get. Can you be a bit more specific? Do you think the real threshold is when the rupture reaches surface? Or if not, what would be the physics behind this? No, I mean, probably I was not clear. I, I think there are, this, this, is, uh, 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 this is a point that must be viewed from different, uh, uh, at, uh, at different scales. If you go at the scale of, for example, of the principal fault, if you have a small displacement, it is something that can favor uh, distributed faulting. Uh, but if you have a large displacement, a large magnitude, so the volume is, is quite big, you can have, yeah, uh, you have a large volume deforming, you can mobilize, yeah, several secondary faults. So, so the, the distributed rupturing, I mean, the, the, the secondary ruptures away from the principal fault can be much, the area affected can be much wider. So it, this was my, this was my, my, my point, basically. For example, in Italy, if you look at the sequence in 2016, first you had a magnitude six with only a sharp rupture on the principal fault, basically. But then on the same fault, longer, you, you know that, that earthquake, uh, you reactivated many place. So that at the end, the pattern of this the rupture was very wide. So it is a positive relation with with displacement and magnitude. So at, at that scale, there is a positive relation, but probably at, at the scale of the principal fault, the relation is inverse. It is not my finding. It, also looking at the literature. Okay. I don't know if I answered the question, yeah, more or less. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good, thanks. Well, again, Paolo, thank you so much for your talk. I think we've all learned a lot. And uh, from the questions, I can see that people are very interested in the topic. And hopefully that helps people who were less familiar uh, initially. We're thank going you, to Anna. continue our Faulty Shah learning series next month. And we have Ross Stein speaking on Coulomb stress transfer on the 12th of April. And then we have Laura Peruzza you know, on May the 10th, so the following month who's going to be talking about terms which are commonly misunderstood within our different disciplines. So I hope you are looking forward to our next two um, events in our learning series as well. So thank you everyone for joining us today, especially thank you to Paolo um, and to those of you who ask questions. And we look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>